Uh, good morning and welcome to the CNBC Africa special. I am Fifi Peters. Now, we are gathered here to discuss something that is very important to all of us, and that is the state of our economy and what that economy is going to look like in the next six months. Now, if the past six months is anything to go by, that picture is not looking very pretty. Of course, we have seen political uncertainty being raised to one of the highest bars in a very long time. We were downgraded to junk status. Uh, unemployment is now sitting at a 14-year high, and business confidence has been crushed to unprecedented lows. And let's not forget the fact that now we are in a recession. But uh, with every story, there's always another side, a uh, more positive side, hopefully. So this is what we're going to try to do today. We're going to try to balance the uh, proposed uh, or the, the positive aspects of our economy with the challenges that we're facing. And we're going to try and shape an overall picture of exactly what the six months is going to look like so that we, as uh, the consumers in this room and the investors in this room, can better prepare for that. And as Alex said, we have gathered some of the country's uh, most best economic minds to help us shape that picture. Allow me to introduce our panelists right now. I have uh, right next to me Dr. Adrian Saville. He is the Chief Investment Officer at Canon Asset Managers and a Professor in Economics and Strategy at the Gordon Institute of Business Science. I have Animal Bishop, who is the Chief Economist at Investec, Lisiba Mutata, who is the Executive Chief Economist at Investment Solutions, Dr. Alna Moolman, who is an Economist at Macquarie, Muziwetu Matema, who is an Economist at KPMG South Africa, and Dumisho Greta, who is an Economic Strategist at Novara Actuaries and Consultants. So let's jump straight into it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal balls right now and tell me what you see for South Africa in the next six months ahead. I mean, in the black African culture, we don't have crystal balls. Uh, we, we are sangomas. So Lisiba, Muzi, and Dumisho, and uh, tell me uh, what you see, what your bones are saying for us in the next six months. So Adrian, I'm going to kick off with you. At the beginning of the year, we had a lot of optimism regarding growth for this country. Since then, we've had the World Bank, we've had National Treasury, and even the Reserve Bank adjust some of those growth forecasts. In that context, how are you feeling about South Africa in the next six months ahead? I'm a, I'm a pirate supporter. <laughs> 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 and that's how I feel. <laughs> But Horrible. there's hope. There's hope. Yeah. Look, if we if we go to the start of 2017, um, I think we have uh, successfully snatched uh, defeat from the jaws of maybe victory would be a grand statement, mm. but start of 2017 looked a lot better than it feels now. Uh, when we came into the year, uh, the effects of drought were uh, receding. Uh, although that's a small sector, it's an important sector with big uh, multiply and spillover effects. Uh, the energy deficit uh, has actually turned South Africa into an energy exporter. Um, commodity prices were sitting up. Uh, add that in, and uh, to that cocktail, uh, add an element of stronger world economic growth. It actually looked like 2017 could produce perhaps even in the order of a two-plus uh, economic growth year. Inflation was receding, the RAND had recovered. It really felt a lot better uh, than 2016. But as we've proceeded into 17, uh, uh, the benefits of those factors have been reversed. And I would put those down to scoring own goals, to stay with my football analogy. I think we've uh, success, uh, successfully and successively scored a number of own goals that help explain the recession. I love the fact that we have this thing, technical recession. I don't know what's technical about it, but you know, it's a recession. Um, and uh, that's the lay of the land. Even if, uh, even, if, even if it were not technical recession or recession though, uh, we're still only talking about 2% growth, uh, which is a far cry from what's really needed to resolve South Africa's far deeper uh, structural issues, entrenched youth unemployment, uh, unemployment, youth unemployment in particular, this grossly skewed Gini coefficient, concentrated industrial structure. 
and Annabelle, you are the queen of a scenario planning. So in terms of your scenarios, best and worst case for South Africa mm -hmm. in the next six months ahead? Well, I think certainly, you know, next week brings us into the start of the next six months. And we certainly are going to be impacted very heavily about what happened in the second quarter of this year. And uh, my belief is that we're probably going to see the recession leach into the second quarter of this year. So it's going to be a three-quarter recession. As Adrian says, there's nothing really technical about it. It's probably going to be similar, if not maybe even worse, to the experience we had in 2009. And that is obviously when we had an economic recession in South Africa on the back of the global events. Instead, what we really have happening now is a synchronized broad-based upswing globally and a strong improvement in global economic growth is expected over the next few years. It's expected to be a fairly gradual in pace, but eventually to reach you know, trend growth and be spread across emerging markets, developed economies, and low-income economies. South Africa, unfortunately, is backing that trend. We're going in the opposite direction. This is not just because we're a metal exporter, although metal exporters are one of the worst afflicted by the commodity price prices that we've seen come off. But I think really for South Africa, as Adrian was talking about, a lot of our own goals. And moving into the second half of this year now, obviously July next week, the worry is what are we going to do to turn this around? We're not anticipating any credit rating downgrades this second half of the year, unless we do some more peculiar moves politically and government-wise, which I think our, our, our um, second quarter was peppered with. But when we move towards the end of November, obviously the credit rating agencies will be reassessing us. Our scenarios really point to either really a 50-50 weighted, I suppose, probability that we carry on in this low, weak growth scenario where it's really you know close to zero, dipping above and below zero, not achieving much on an economic growth front or an employment front, or else the down case scenario, which as I said we give an even weighting, is that we do actually lose our local currency credit ratings. We think that if that happens, it'll probably more likely be next year, but the risk obviously is this year. And Senator and Purse has already said, if we continue to tinker with our institutions, like removing inflation targeting, for example, then it will happen. Mm -hmm. So that's the way that we see it. The, the, the down case scenario is one where we will see sharp currency weakness, probably towards the magnitude of 19 rand to the US dollar. Certainly past Nine 17, yeah, remember we went to 17 the last time round. Mm -hmm. The risk is now we go beyond 17, we move towards 19. We might not reach 19, but we could see it because structurally now things are a bit worse and could actually cause a further depreciation. Again, though, that'll depend on the timing. When do those credit rating downgrades happen if they do in the down case scenario? Mm -hmm. And obviously, what type of global financial market environment do we have? Risk on or risk off? So that's our down case scenario. We can unpack it more fully later. We do see ourselves coming back from that currency weakness and obviously from the inflation um, shock. Obviously, if we remove our core institutional strengths in South Africa and we continue to see credit rating downgrades, we get into what we call an extreme down case scenario. But maybe we should rather talk about the expected case for today. <laughs> All right, so in terms of the next six months ahead, up case scenario, we're not expecting another downgrade. That's uh, we not up case, that's expected case. Expected case. Yes, We're not expecting yes. another downgrade. We this are year, this year. Six months, we yeah. are expecting uh, to remain in the recession in the third quarter. Second, yeah, in, in the second quarter of this right. year. Right. In the, the second third quarter, we rebound out of it. We rebound. Okay. Yeah. So, Lisiba, on to your predictions. Will the past be indicative <laughs> of where we headed next for the next six months? <laughs> 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 now, so, trying time for our country. However, we need to appreciate how small and open South Africa is. And not also underestimate the forces that are helping globally. So, if you look at the outcomes in the markets now, has left many very surprised. Why are we here? Why is rand here? Why is bond yields actually held up? Um, why is the equity market not fallen out of bed? in the midst of the, the way we feel, you know, is the real economy, what's on the ground relative to what the market is, is feeling, of, there's a dichotomy there. And in it, I think it reflects this. South Africa, we need to appreciate also that it has seen now two quarters of a trade surplus. Mm -hmm. um, it is exporting more. Um, admittedly, the rate of growth in our ex exports can be better, but it is positive. 
and also imports are falling because of the strong rand and also the import bill that we have is largely oil. With oil not going up, the rand is helping materially there. So these exports are important because there was work done by uh, the IMF that showed that South Africa and its exposure to the global economy is much more in the last five years interwoven with that of China. Um, when you take a longer history, say 15 years, you find that it was much more interwoven with what is happening out of the EU. So with China not falling out of bed, falling out of bed, there is growth that is less than 6.5%. So they held, they're holding that up. That helps SA. Um, it helps in, in a big way because commodity prices, although they are rolling over, it's not a precipitous decline. I do believe that the cycle will still be on an upswing. It's nowhere near a super cycle in commodities, but it's helpful. So what I'm saying is that while there is internal issues, and we have seen a, a, a decoupling of SA growth from OECD countries, um, it's showing that these, these risks or these outcomes that we're feeling are very domestic in nature. Um, the outcome could be even worse if we didn't have global tides helping. It could be in flows, it could be in exports, as I was talking here. Uh, and I think even when you look at some leading indicators, in the midst of all the negativity we feel, you look at the SOB's leading indicator, which is a good proxy of what could happen in the next six <laughs> months. It has much more explanatory power around GDP outcomes. It's showing that it's not going to be a Brazilian type of recession, which was two years worth. So what I'm saying here is potentially we're going to see more of growth that's similar to last year. But we're not a Brazil. Uh, the only problem is when we talk of our country, it always feels like it's going to be like a two-year drag long recession. Um, but I don't see that happening. I see uh, more of last year, which in itself is completely inadequate of dealing with the issues that we have in the country. But at the same time, it's not a complete collapse as if South Africa will be a Venezuela, as, as some will have it. All right, so a slightly uh, upbeat view there, but definitely the consensus that we could be in a better shape. Now, uh, Dr. Alne Mulman, in terms of your forecast for the next six months, obviously we will be having the medium-term uh, budget policy statement within that time in October. What should we be bracing for? As we know, a government is walking a tight rope in terms of trying to rein in spending, but raising revenue is difficult for our government right now in this uh, slow growth economy your forecast. So starting on the growth side of your question, second quarter must still be very, very weak, right? So first quarter was still quite weak. Second quarter is really when political uncertainty increased dramatically. And we can see that in survey results. PR surveys, for example, reflect that, that we are now at unprecedented levels of political uncertainty. So, so I think the first point from a growth perspective is the ANC conferences, both in, the, in this coming weekend and at the end of the year, will be absolutely critical in trying to resolve that political uncertainty. So firstly, hopefully giving us more certainty, and secondly, giving us some indication of what type of policies we are going to pursue in the medium term. So that will be absolutely critical in determining things. So if we get some certainty in the next couple of days from this ANC policy conference, then we could have some additional support from a growth perspective in the second half coming from that. But I think that probability is, is very low that we'll have a significant reduction in policy certainty at this stage. So, so if that's the case, the only stimulant that I see in the second half of the year is really inflation coming down. So we see inflation going to maybe 4.5% at the end of the year. Remember, it was 6.5% at the end of last year. And that should give a little bit of support to, to the consumers in particular. So, so that could only really be the only growth driver in the second half of the year, so we could have a little bit of positive growth there. If we then come to the second part of your question and focusing a little bit on fiscal policy, mm -hmm. I don't expect massive changes in the NTBPS, partly because that's, that's the, the norm, so typically the bigger announcements are rather made in the budget. Um, 
And secondly, because we still have to make some of these bigger policy decisions, again, it wouldn't necessarily be appropriate to then make sudden changes in the MTBPS while we're still figuring out the rest of the policy framework and choices, etc. Mm -hmm. Next year, however, is a, is a different scenario. In other words, next year we will have to have more tax increases. They will probably be biased towards the higher income groups again. Mm -hmm. And maybe just to elaborate a little bit on the consumer story, um, I do believe that it's the middle and middle higher income groups that are under the most pressure. In other words, they're not really seeing a massive benefit from falling inflation. Their inflation rates are relatively stable. Um, and of course, you've had the, the tax increases, significant tax increases in this budget, which will be another factor pulling down growth in the second quarter of the year, which will be the first quarter of the full impact of all of those tax increases. Muzi, let's actually stay with the politics. As Dr. Alna has pointed out, we are on the eve of the ANC policy conference that kicks off tomorrow. Politics played a big role, as Dr. Alna said, in shaping the first half of the year. To what extent do you see it shaping the second half of the year? And do you agree with her that the probability of policy certainty going forward is currently low? I, I think, um, firstly, let me talk of the growth story, then we, I'll attend to your question. I think just to add to what the rest of the panelists have said, when we look at the bonds that the sub released last week, which is the, the latest sort of quarterly bulletin, you do see the leading indicator showing an uptick in the last two months. And historically, the lead time for the economy to respond after the leading indicator has moved is close to eight and a half months, which of course is outside the six month horizon period. But we do see some sort of um, uptick or change away from the recession. So there is a likelihood that we might not have an L-shaped prolonged uh, recession. But however, in, in the past, when we had a sharp return from recession was in 2009-8, when we had the fiscal space to, to spend ourselves out of the recession. We currently don't have that fiscal space to spend ourselves out of that recession. So that risk still exists. And there's also the, 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 the structural issues that Adrian touched that persist in the South African economy. So in as much as we can reverse to quarter, uh, positive port on quarter growth, there's a very strong likelihood that we will not be seeing strong growth in South Africa, which means the crisis of growth will still persist in the next coming years. So it's not a uh, recession is, a, is, a, is obviously a, a a very, very adverse effect of weak growth, but weak growth itself, was still, those conditions should still persist for a while. So going back to your question now on, on political risk, I think um, political risk basically creates a trust deficit uh, between uh, policymakers, household consumers, and the international community at large. So we, we are currently in a global geopolitical recession, so it's not really a uniquely South African thing. And we see geopolitical risk rising in the UK and the US and, and, and um, in our recent economics uh, um, CEO survey, CEOs did highlight that they're not as comfortable doing business, say, with the UK as they were, say, last year. But now to, 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 to highlight the, the point that uh, what outcomes will come out from the ANC policy uh, in the coming two quarters, the risk there is, I think I'm confident that the ANC will come up with a very eloquent, eloquent and articulate statement, but it's always the implementation efficiency of whatever policy we've come up with. The NDP was very eloquent, articulately written, GEAR was the same, and whatever comes out from the, this ANC policy, I assume will be also well written and well placed, and will have the right things to discuss issues around inequality, but it's always the implementation efficiency around that, and that's where the trust deficit arises. And then uh, Dumisho, so Muzi's talking about a crisis of uh, growth that we're currently experiencing now. What does that mean for your forecasts uh, for the next six months, and particularly within the context of employment, which is not really looking good at this stage? Uh, thank you, Fifi. I'd just like to pick up on, on what you said in terms of the leading indicator, and Lisiba, you also alluded to that. Um, what has been interesting is, yes, we have been seeing this uh, tick up quite aggressively over the last couple of months. But if we take away the favorable uh, global impacts, we're actually seeing a less aggressive uptick in the leading indicator. Mm -hmm. So again, this just mm -hmm. suggests to us that um, all the, the, no, the, the positivity that we've seen, um, we rely very heavily on external factors. So again, I think for me here is to say, yes, we've had a lot of own goals, but South Africa is still very vulnerable to what happens in the rest of the world. Um, in terms of exports, I know Lisiba was talking about a trade surplus that we're currently seeing. I think for the last two um, numbers that we've seen have been positive. And I think we will continue to see a trade surplus, but I think it won't necessarily be because of maybe more favorable terms of trades or higher commodity prices. It will really be based 
on the fact that imports um, would have pulled back because we do have weaker consumer demand. So, you know, in terms of, you know, what is the outlook now for South Africa? What does this mean for uh, investment? I think I echo what a lot of the panelists here have been saying is that we need to uh, ensure that we have, uh, you know, good, stable policies because at the moment, as you said in the beginning, we are seeing a very weak um, business sentiment, which means that investments don't come in, and then therefore we see um, businesses a lot more reluctant to hire uh, employers, and of course then we've got this uncomfortably high unemployment rate that we sit with, therefore we've got weaker consumer demand and therefore weaker consumer sentiment. So you know, those are just some of the things that uh, we have been keeping an eye on, and overall I do think that you know, South Africa's economic growth will continue to struggle. Let's actually bring it back to the policy uh, conversation because we do have that policy a conference by the ANC that kicks off tomorrow. So I imagine the rhetoric there will be that of radical economic transformation and I'm hoping that everybody in the room uh, right now understands what that means. I think our government has uh, gone to great lengths to try and explain to us. But we've had two radical policies uh, being tabled recently in the form of the new mining charter and also the subs or the proposed uh, uh, changes to the sub mandate. Adrian, I'll bring this uh, to you in terms of, number one, should we be expecting the introduction of more radical policies as we have a ruling, a party right now that wants to claw back the uh, votes that they have lost? And what will that mean in the context of the uh, two tabled radical policies that many investors and many economists are saying will not be conducive for our growth? I think to you know to Musi's point, one of the one of the best ways of monitoring policy in South Africa is not to read or listen to what the ANC says. Watch what they do. Um, to me, that's the that's the tell. Uh, it's not what they say; it's what they do. Um, and I think, uh, I think Muzi, it was also your point that a you know, very eloquent statement, expect uh, eloquent statements to be made and uh, grand proposals. Unfortunately, and this is my reference to their own goals, is uh, the statements have become increasingly grand, I think, as the political landscape has become more and more tense. Um, and the most recent pronouncements on uh, uh, challenging the mandate of the Saab, uh, to me, goes into the landscape of reckless. Uh, this is one of South Africa's most important institutions in governing policy. We have world-class macroeconomic policy in both uh, fiscal and monetary policy, and a direct assault or attack on the South African Reserve Bank. I, I can't find any word other than reckless uh, to describe it. Uh, what none of that changes is the importance for radical economic transformation. Um, and th that is not just about, uh, 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 that's not just a call for the public sector to do stuff. Uh, there are important and obvious changes required in the public sector. Equally though, the private sector uh, has a role to play. And I'm not sure who made this suggestion, but uh, I, I think it was uh, Gwede Mantashi who said the private sector in South Africa uh, caused the recession. And I would go so far as to say he's absolutely right. Uh, that it is the private sector that drives South Africa's economy. And if we're in recession, uh, it's a, you've got to go and look at the private sector to not ask, well, why are we here? How did we get here? And there is, uh, in that, I think the single most powerful explanatory factor is the absence of investment spending. And that investment spending requires an appetite and a capability, a willingness on the part of the private sector, and it requires a framework provided on the part of the public sector. And before we touch on investment spending, I'd like to uh, just get all the politics out the way and speak on these 200,000 Gupta leaked emails that we uh, keep reading, very uh, scandalous and tantalizing stories about, scary stories, however, about the extent of state capture. Annabelle, so far we've seen a very minimal response in our financial markets to these allegations, very strong allegations of state capture in the event that the next six months includes the emails being verified as authentic. 
what impact are you likely to, or we likely to see on financial markets? What's the RAND likely to do? What are our investments likely to do? Well, I think the reason we have seen such limited impact so far on our financial markets speaks to the fact that our financial markets are really determined by what happens overseas. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about global risk on, what we actually mean by that is a global appetite of investors to buy what they perceive as risky assets. And that could perhaps be seen as equities, but it's more likely seen as emerging market assets. And in particular, if you look at since the start of this year, we've seen an extremely strong directional bias towards local currency emerging market debt and there has been equity purchases as well and really you know this has been driven by a number of factors so it is a strong trend that has come through this year and something which could continue for a while. It's been driven by a number of factors, some of which include the low yield that you get in many developed economies. And if you look at the Eurozone, you're close to zero, whereas in South Africa, your bond rate is eight, eight and a half percent, perhaps for a 10 year bond. And that gives you a very nice return to borrow on and make significant money as if you're a foreign investor. South Africa maintains its investment grade status on two of its bonds, uh, two of its uh, credit ratings on its local currency bonds, and that obviously is Moody's and Standard & Poor's. So from that perspective, foreign investors globally are making hay while the sun shines and coming into South Africa's financial market. Nothing has changed much for them because the yield is still there. It's still easy to get in and out. We have very sophisticated financial markets, so that strong positive investment story is still there. Some of the other factors which are also driving global risk on as well is the fact that a lot of the portfolios are actually underweight emerging markets mm -hmm. and you know the United States hasn't started hiking interest rates dramatically yet so the story is still there the investment story is still there and what's really happening what this means for South Africa is that substantial purchases of our debt our government bonds has been causing the RAND to strengthen a fair amount and it's also caused the bond yields, besides their little leap up when we had the credit rating downgrades, they've come off quite a bit as well. So in the absence of this global risk on environment, we would have had a very much more negative impact on our financial markets because of our credit rating downgrades and because of obviously what's been happening in our politics. But from a foreign investor's perspective, all they're really interested in is making money. And if they can come into our markets, buy our bonds, earn a good return and sell them as soon as they want to, then that story holds and it also is self-reinforcing as well because global risk on means that there should be some currency strength or stability in those emerging markets so they're probably not going to lose out from a translation effect either because they're holding rand denominated assets if we see a huge depreciation that would obviously impact their returns but if globally you've got this risk on then that's also been a positive story as well so this has really provided an overlay or something that's obfuscated it's 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 made the waters cloudy in terms of what would the real effect have been on the credit rating downgrades if you in a big global risk off period, we probably would have seen significantly more currency weakness and we would also have probably seen higher bond yields as well. And of course you look at where we go to from here because this is a six month outlook story and we said obviously that we probably in our expected case only really looking for downgrades next year after the ANC conference at the end of year has come through with the results. And that really means that we're probably going to maintain at least one local currency credit rating this year. So that trend could continue. So even if we do see more information coming out about these emails, and it does appear that it's the sheer volume, the absolute size and quantity of all this information that's really proving to be an impediment because there needs to be such huge analysis of it that a lot of people, I think, have become a bit immune to this constant, endless flow of bad news, you know. And the global financial markets obviously are less interested because they're just after the yield. So we would really see what happens in the second half of this. Is there going to be some type of clarity that comes out of it which actually speaks to a change in government. I think people have become a bit disheartened. And even though there's so much information, nothing appears to be done nothing appears to be done with it. And if we get towards the end of the year, and maybe it, it does actually mean something, and there is going to be some type of change, then we might see some reaction in the markets. Maybe there could be a positive reaction because they believe that we could be on a change, a change in political will, and therefore we might be accepting a better 
type of growth formula, looking at a, a more type of global norms growth formula, instead of what Adrian was saying, where we really are going into a dark territory, a very dark alley, you know, where if you start to change your institutions, you actually lose the core values that you actually are being rated on. And we can't just fall into sub-investment grade, we can actually fall below that into a junk status. A worrying, so worrying picture that yeah, would be. Yeah, that, that's the concern you would have on the negative side. On the positive side, we could see that information come out and we actually see a positive outcome and perhaps some change from that. But I think our expected case is we continue as we are. Well, Without Annabelle, some major disruptions here. Well, Annabelle, uh, thank you so much for those insights. We are going to hit pause on the conversation right now. We are headed into a short uh, break. Uh, we will continue uh, discussing uh, what to expect for our, from the South African economy in uh, the next six months when we return. Well, welcome back. We are still unpacking a very important conversation about our economy and what it will look like in the next six months. And uh, before we uh, departed for a short break, we were speaking about the politics and trying to understand to what extent uh, that would shape the economy. And it's from there that we actually pick off or pick up, uh, rather, Lesiba, staying on the politics. So... Let's talk about another controversial term, that of white monopoly capital, if you allow us to be frank in this room. Uh, coined or said to be coined by uh, Bal Pottinger in London. So we're gonna have, we're gonna talk about London English right now. So a, a report by Deloitte uh, yesterday released some very worrying stats uh, that you know the, uh, the senior executives of the top 100 companies uh, said to earn uh, 69,000 Rand a day. Uh, 69,000. And if we break down that top 100, uh, it's, uh, the list is looking very uh, male and, and, and pale. But in this context, uh, does, or the, in the context of inequality, I think that many people here will agree that it doesn't matter who is earning 69,000 rand a day, black or white. Inequality in South Africa is a huge problem. And according to that uh, Deloitte report, we are looking at a ratio of 500 to 1, difference in pay. Is a, ratio, is a ratio like that the kind of ratio that takes South Africa forward, irrespective of who is coining that salary? It, it undoubtedly does not take South Africa forward. There is, a, there is a need to transform, and it's inherited. So if you have a, an economy that was purposefully constructed to concentrate every single value chain in the hands of the few. And now later, 23 years later, that has not even changed. There ought to be a conversation to that end. Um, for example, there's seemingly there's a pushback towards transformation, which I find perplexing. Why? Because it's one thing to talk about growth, um, and that is an academic term that you read in, an, in, 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 a, in a textbook written by, by an American. But when you look at South Africa, it's not just growth that matters, but the quality of growth is very important. Mm. You can have exploitive growth. In other words, it's concentrated in the hands of the few, it's eking out from the incumbents, or some international firm just comes and, and, and crowds out everyone else domestic, exploiting the growth. And we'll look at number, it will come out as 8% GDP, which we have seen in the country. You get it environmentally unfriendly, so you can create growth by just destroying the environment, it's featureless. But you need inclusive growth, and we ought as a country to come to a recognition that the status quo has been unfruitful. The result of it has been unemployment at this high rates with perpetual exclusion that's entrenched. So the pushback on transformation is unwarranted and we ought to, I think, I think pretentious. Um, we need the majority of the country to be part of the productive capacity, productive assets of the country. But how do you get to it is a big question. 
Um, and, and, and therein we need to have a much more pragmatic approach of doing it. But to push away on radical economic transformation for me is disingenuous. Um, because, and to say we can now have inclusive growth where we actually now are talking about the quality of growth that is critical here ought to be had. We ought to have that discussion. So <laughs> I'm, I'm saying these inequalities is unsustainable South Africa cannot persist to be in this position indefinitely. And also, when you bring in the developmental change that are happening globally, the fourth industrial revolution, mm -hmm. which can exacerbate this problem when you look at SA, uh, not, not in the next six months, but you look in the long term, there's much more that's required and you cannot deal with the fourth industrial revolution, which includes people being, being, being uh, replaced by robots by just looking at a, a, a component of the economy that's owned by a few and being protected as such. In fact, that protection that is, uh, I can see happen in the country and I can see messages that are intended to protect. Um, it will not sustain even that what you're trying to get to when we put the fourth industrial revolution and the impact of it over that. We ought to change, we ought to have this discussion the hard way. Well and Dr. Alna, uh, if, 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 uh, I couldn't help but notice everybody nodding there <laughs> as Lucibe was speaking about a pushback to transformation that we are seeing. Your thoughts? I, I want to make two points. So the first is, if we think about transformation, I think that there are at least three key aspects to that. And it is very important that there should be enough focus on all three. So one is transformation in terms of racial transformation. One is transformation in terms of income equality. And the third one is transformation of the economy to put it on a more competitive, higher trend and potential growth path. I do think it's very important that, that all three should be receiving at least the same amount of uh, um, attention in, in all of these discussions and all of the policy discussions. And, and my one worry is that if I look at the ANC policy conference discussion documents for this weekend, the one which I think is somewhat neglected is the economic growth one. And I think it's very important that when we talk about inclusive growth, the inclusive part is absolutely critical, but so is the growth part. So that's my first point. My second point comes back to Adrian's point of earlier, namely that it's the private sector and the public sector. In other words, we have these, let's call it three issues that we have to deal with, and no single institution can deal with this. In other words, the public sector alone can't resolve any of these three. Mm -hmm. The private sector, neither. So, so what is absolutely desperately needed is that everybody comes together and resolve this. So it should be ideally, in my view, a place such as NetLuck. It hasn't been functionally optimally up to now in this regard, but I think you need a place where you can have the input from business and government and labor to, to talk about all three. I do think we have seen some encouraging signals over the last week or so, if we think about the BUSA statements, the business leadership, and BLSA talking to Kasato and both of them coming together and saying, look, we have these differences, but these are the touching points on which we agree. That is absolutely critical. So encouraging statements, but uh, is it encouraging enough to get that relationship between business and uh, government to the level where it was when uh, fi the former finance minister, Pravin Gordon, was heading that campaign? And without the tightness of that relationship, can we truly emerge, number one, from a recession, number two, back to investment grade? Muzi? Um, I think... In as much as the, the former finance minister had a very solid relationship with uh, the, the business sector, we must concede that even during his tenure, we had a very weak uh, uh, growth environment. We had sliding uh, fiscal deficits. Yes, the, 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 the unexpected reshuffling and removal of the finance minister did widen uh, the trust deficit, apart from the other fiscal deficits, which led us to some of the downgrade crisis that we, we, we find ourselves in. Um, but just to reflect back to what Lisiba said about uh, uh, radical e economic transformation, it's, Im it's important that we understand that radical economic transformation is not a unique South African construct. 
Um, Dubai 60 years ago was a fishing village and it radically economically transformed. Uh, Dubai, I wonder why you mentioned that country. <laughs> 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 <You're obsessed. laughs> okay, Sing Singapore. <laughs> uh, yes, but to bring it closer home, Zimbabwe 30 years ago was the agricultural bag basket of, 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 of Africa and it radically economically transformed negatively. So radical economic transformation is not uh, a South African construct and it's, 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 it's happened throughout the ages. But what's important is that we need to, co to take cognizance that positive radical economic transformation in South Africa is not a zero-sum game. It should not be one where one population group aggressively extracts from the other, as we've seen in the past, whether it's black, whether it's white. It should be an inclusive type of radical economic transformation. And at the same time, the fact that we are at the dawn of an industrial revolution, which would demand very strong, say, STEM type of skills, we need to take cognizance of the quality of education is a child who is born in South Africa today as prepared to compete with a child born in Singapore in terms of science, technology, engineering, mathematics? Probably not. And that speaks to an issue of skills deficit that we have in the country. And there's also structural implications of the level of employment that South Africa can generate even in a high growth environment without addressing uh, those issues. Again, Lesiba also spoke about uh, the resistance to radical economic transformation. They said he was surprised by that. I'm not surprised by that. And, and uh, I think in South Africa, it's, it's, it's always particularly maybe um, get a lot of attention because of the color divide. But economic history is, is flooded with, uh, uh, with this resistance between those who have and those that do not have, whether they were white or black or white or white or black or black. There's always that resistance for those who hold uh, economic privilege against those that do not hold uh, economic privilege. And I think it's also human uh, behavior, human nature. Yeah. Most of us are resistant to change, so that will definitely take some time. But let's take it back to what's happening in the rest of the world. Dumisho, so right now we've got uh, Brexit negotiations there. After that UK election, no one really knows what the outlook for the UK is going to be over the next two years. So we've got US President uh, Donald Trump there, who has uh, so far been all talk, uh, very little action. So in terms of the next six months ahead, and what is happening offshore? How will that shape South Africa? Um, very interesting points you, you make there, and I think that's also been a theme that's been uh, coming through. Um, I think the role of central banks, I think, uh, over the past couple of months or so, was being questioned. Uh, but comments coming through yesterday from the likes of Drahi from the ECB talking about possibly uh, cutting down on stimulus, uh, Fed uh, rhetoric that has been a lot more hawkish than expected. I think yesterday was interesting to see that we did uh, start to see a spike in bond yields. Um, and that we also saw a spike in our South African bond yields. We were sitting around 8.4 and now we're sitting at 8.7. So again, we are also seeing the impact of what global events uh, can have. Uh, in terms of Trump, uh, we do know that, um, you know, a lot of what he said is going to be watered down and we're not going to see the, the same type of stimulus, uh, the fiscal stimulus that we had been expecting before. Um, but we are still expecting that we might see a little bit of stimulus uh, that is likely to still come through. I just want to um, take a detour and, and come back to, to the local front in terms of, of politics because I do think that when it comes to the transformation agenda and what needs to be done to address certain issues does need uh, you know, some attention. Um, We've been talking about what needs to happen, and I think if we look at what's happened over the past six months, it's very evident that uh, economic policy and uh, political policies have certainly played a role in where we are. So I'm very wary to paint emerging markets with the same paintbrush, and that's not what I'm going to be doing in my next uh, example here. But I'd like to look at the Fragile Five, and I think the reason I'm doing that um, is because at a point they all had very similar um, uh, characteristics. So we were looking at low growth, uh, widening current account deficits, and the fact that they were all uh, very dependent on you know, an external or global credit. So in the case of Indonesia and India, we saw a change in leadership and therefore we saw a change in the prospects for these particular, com uh, these particular countries. Um, Turkey was a bit of an outlier. Then we've got the case of Brazil. This is before uh, the recent developments that happened, but when Dilma Rousseff was uh, removed, we actually got the sense and the sentiment around Brazil was slightly more positive. 
And South Africa, we now sit at this crossroads of what is going to happen with our current leadership. And I think what I'm also trying to, to show here is that change in leadership and change in policies um, can certainly have a ripple effect and can change things that we are trying to, you know, to, to make different. Uh, the situation with, uh, you know, with Brazil at the moment is, is also very telling on how quickly things can change. So, you know, I think after we had the cabinet reshuffle, what was interesting is on the Friday, the markets hadn't reacted as badly as we thought they were going to. And then there was a sense that something was going to happen over the weekend that would change things. Something would happen. And over the next six months, I'm not really convinced that we would see something dramatic. So on the political front, I would say that it's still going to be pretty much a wait and see approach. So we're going to be waiting for the next six months and for December to happen for us to see and get some clarity on where we're sitting in terms of changing leadership and what that means for economic and political um, policy. And in terms of uh, that wait and see approach, I suppose it's wait and see uh, not only here, but also in the UK and in the US that are confronted with their own political uncertainty. And I'd like to throw uh, an open question here. So every other day you read headlines about South African companies making acquisitions offshore in the very regions that we're talking about that are also confronted with their political uncertainty in the UK. Some going into Australia, dependent on the commodity cycle just like us, and also are feeling the pains of, of the commodity prices there. My question is, if political uncertainty is what is constraining business confidence here in South Africa, why is SA Inc. finding it more palatable to handle the political uncertainty offshore versus that of its own home country here. I don't know who'd like to vote Muzi. Yeah, it's interesting you put it that way. We, we recently uh, finalized our CEO survey. We, so we took 90 CEOs and we asked them a couple of questions. And they did raise the issue that they were concerned about uh, geopolitical dealings even in the UK. These are SA-based CEOs. So I think we are obviously in a geopolitical recession globally. And I think uh, uh, geopolitical risks are no longer an emerging market phenomenon to the extent that we've seen uh, market-related and economic-related weakness coming from the EU and the UK because of Brexit, also Trump-related. So, so, and, and that comes really from the fact that traditionally strong institutions are now under a lot of uh, political pressure globally and, and also issues around uh, uh, global trade and finance. Uh, factors that do drive global trade have also become under a lot of scrutiny and don't have the same political support, say, that they did uh, pre-populism. So I think I'm, I have a different view that there is rising risks both internally in South Africa, and South African CEOs do reflect that they are, at least 60% of them say that they are very concerned about their dealings and very cautious about their dealings uh, in, in, in these geopolitically affected areas. So I think geopolitical risks are now a global phenomenon more than they have been in the past. Yeah. And Adrian, would you agree with uh, that statement? And this follows on to your uh, quoting of Guerra Manteche, who did say that uh, the uh, private sector was responsible for that recession. Would you agree with what Muzi is saying? I think it was uh, Elner that made the point. Um, there is no example uh, that I can give you of a country that has achieved uh, socio-economic prosperity um, uh, in the absence of a public-private cohesion. Mm. Um, that this is a this is a it is a it's a necessary condition mm -hmm. uh, for us to achieve uh, socio-economic prosperity, and. With, with CEOs looking offshore for the solution mm. uh, to their business problem, they're looking in the wrong place. Uh, the, the problem is at home. And I would go so far as to say um, that South Africa sits on top of a crisis. Mm -hmm. And the crisis parades in at least three shapes. The country is young, it's unemployed, and it is unequal. Uh, and to imagine that you can find solutions to that problem by some capital allocation offshore <laughs> says to me you haven't understood the problem. Yeah. Not sure I've Are you finished? I think was I'm that done. your drop mic? <laughs> 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 Missed it there, sorry. So, yeah. <laughs> but 
but we did say that we we're going to balance the scale here. So we're going to speak about the challenges that our economy is uh, facing right now, but we're also going to see if there are any green shoots that we should highlight. And Anna, allow me to come to you uh, for this. Are there any green shoots that you are expecting uh, to manifest in the next six months? In the next six months, coming back to my very first point, it's really all about inflation coming down, giving a little bit of relief. Um, that's, that's the only one that I can see. Other than that, I think this is going to be wait and see. So, so you can't have expansion both in terms of investment, so you can't have um, expanding capacity, you can't employ more people. So everything else is really just going to trend sideways, trade water for the next six months. Inflation coming down, what about interest rates? Annabelle? Look, I think before we had this disturbing attack on the South African Reserve Bank's um, independence, we obviously were looking at a situation in South Africa where its output gap was widening quite dramatically. And what that really means is your actual economic growth that's come out, we obviously having been in a recession, and your potential growth, what the economy could grow at, is differing quite a bit because obviously actual growth is falling. And that in itself would have indicated the increased possibility of interest rate cuts. Also, of course, as well, the fact that inflation was always expected to fall down towards the end of this year because of the um, fact that the drought in most areas of the country has been alleviated. And we've obviously had some significant currency strength as well. So all of that would have talked to the Reserve Bank thinking of becoming a bit more dovish. We certainly anticipate that its next monetary policy meeting, which is going to be in July, we'll probably see a more dovish tone come out. If it hadn't been for this interference about the Saab independence, they may well have seen fit to cut in the second half of this year. Now it's become a lot more cloudy because we don't don't know which route they're going to take. They don't want to be seen to be succumbing to pressure, but on the other hand, they want to do a very good analysis of the statistics. They've already put out some feelers and indicated that potentially some of their forecasts may have been a touch high for oil or for a few other factors. And all of that talks about them maybe tipping down their view, because that's really what's key here, the outlook of their view on inflation. So they only make their change to interest rates based on what they believe inflation will be in about a six to 24 month period, but most particularly in a 12 to 18 month period. So that really puts us into next year. If they believe inflation is going to be around about the 4.5% mark, they can feel comfortable cutting interest rates at their next meeting. We think that might be a bit soon for them, so we would look instead for them first to change their tone to one of being a bit more dovish, then to perhaps revising their inflation forecast down a bit, and maybe then at the subsequent meeting, if they still feel that factors are in place, which could moderate their inflation outlook somewhat further, then they potentially would actually cut interest rates. Um, and that could obviously then be at the, the, the meeting after that. Maybe September, August, September, we could then maybe see an interest rate cut transpire. It will depend very much on the politics and whether there's going to be further noise and interference around the bank as well, because that's obviously um, redirected their attention as well. Uh, can we just do a mini CNBC uh, poll right now regarding uh, interest rate cuts? I know economists get called all the time. In terms of uh, the next policy, a meeting by the MPC, who, a show of hands, who is seeing a cut? No cut. <laughs> right. So installments, uh, vehicle installments, mortgages, everything are staying the same. So still a pretty tough times ahead there. I'd like to speak about a DIY guide that maybe we can propose here for consumers, more specifically consumers, but also investors. In staying in this economy that finds itself in a recession, that finds itself in a tough spot. So a DIY recession guide, what should we be doing? Adrian. Uh, you know, once you're, once you're in the recession, it's, it's often uh, the, the tube is out the toothpaste, uh, the, the toothpaste is out the tube. You know, so the, the things that you ideally should have done, um, it's a little too late. Uh, what can you do uh, in, the, in, in this circumstance? I think it's to look for optionality uh, and to try and figure out, uh, you know, w w not just what the green shoots are, but what's possible, what's available. And on this front, uh, not to be naively optimistic, I think that's dangerous uh, to be naively optimistic, but uh, to look for patches of or, 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 or parts of silver lining. And here are two examples. Mm -hmm. the, the one is that the second fastest growing region in, in the world is Sub-Saharan Africa. On a recent uh, trip to Rwanda, I was surprised that in a retail outlet, most of the stock is not regionally produced. That it's import from a long way away. So, you know, retailers are stocking Indonesian goods. 
there's a prospect. Mm. Uh, and Rwanda is close, uh, cultural distance is low, and language barriers are zero. Mm -hmm. um, another example, perhaps, of optionality or uh, available prospect would be, uh, Elna spoke about uh, the need to raise taxes. Uh, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, like, no more. It's still going to come. <laughs> like, can we tap out at some point? It's going to come. Uh, South Africa spends as much as any other middle-income economy on education and healthcare spend as a percentage of GDP, yet we have some of the worst results. So there's a prospect to rearrange the furniture, and that doesn't require more spending, it just requires a change in behavior. Drop the mic. I Drop got it mic. this time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when I pause for long times. <laughs> and Annabelle? I think certainly when you talk about recession-proofing yourself, you know, I suppose we see it already coming through in consumer confidence. Consumer confidence is depressed, which really means people are not looking to buy big-ticket items, and people are obviously being cautious on debt. And that's something I think which people do need to be. It also speaks as well the confidence reading about concerns about future employment prospects, income prospects, all of those issues. So from the consumer side, certainly that's a worry. But perhaps looking at something you know even more important for our six six month to maybe even five-year outlook is what can really be turned around in the business sector to try and change business confidence because that is the kicker that if you look at our private corporate business sector that is what drives economic growth in any country in the world South Africa or otherwise and really the reason we say that is government doesn't actually produce incomes it just takes taxes from the corporate sector the corporate sector provides incomes from households so it all comes back to your businesses in any country in the world that you are in and why is business confidence so depressed why has it been depressed since 2009 you know read, if reading of 41 really indicating that 59% on average of business owners have been dissatisfied with business conditions since 2009. That's a very long period. You would have thought by, by now there would have been you know, some work done on it to try and change these, these core fundamental factors. And sure, the fact that economic growth has been deteriorating in that period and that downward trend doesn't inspire businesses to expand, to employ more staff, to build capacity, factories, etc. But also as well in terms of what needs to change in South Africa's working environment, I really think that the CEO initiative is a very positive example, getting business, the corporate sector and getting government and getting labour to all work together is absolutely key for South Africa's future. Unfortunately, it's on that note where we're going to have to leave this. We have run out of time. We thoroughly hope that you enjoyed uh, watching and that you are better prepared to deal with your economy and what it will look like in uh, the next six uh, months. Uh, from myself, Fifi Peters, thank you so much for watching and uh, goodbye. <laughs>